Good morning. How are we doing? Let's give our fourth and fifth graders a hand for being in here. Pumped. In 2007, a major marketing conference took place in Tokyo, Japan. And so marketers and companies sent their marketing teams from all over the world to Tokyo. And this is what the conference was around. They brought in futurists who were reading the coming trends in the culture to speak on what they would be predicting and then how these marketers would respond and go home and sell. Now, at this time, 2007, cell phones were exploding. Maybe you were one of the cool kids that had the flip phone. Don't you love the flip phone? That was so amazing. You could be talking to someone and go, all right, see ya, pop. Oh, just such, oh, I've missed the flip phone. Does anyone in here have a flip phone? We have, a, awesome, I see a couple of hands. So cell phones were emerging and so these trend experts at this conference in Tokyo, this is what they said. In the next five years, this is a coming trend, there will be a rebellion worldwide, a rebellion of teenagers who will be in mass getting rid of their cell phones. They are tired of being tracked by their parents. They are tired of being sold to. They are tired of being the product. And they will rebel and get rid of their cell phones. And so this marketing conference was all around how do we sell to young people who are refusing or who will refuse to be on their phones. That was the whole marketing conference. This was 2007. In 2010, 5 million more teenagers than ever before purchased a smartphone. 5 million more. No one got rid of their cell phones. What happened to the rebellion? What happened to the movement? Well, here's what happened at that marketing conference. They realized that the only way to sell to a generation who would possibly reject their phones was to make their phones more attractive and more addicting. And they were successful. Today, it's not unusual to not only see teenagers and adults staring at their phones throughout the day, but also little babies in the back of their mom's SUV. So what has happened in the lives of young people, which is what Mark wanted me to talk about this morning in our final week of Undistracted, what has happened in the lives of young people since 2010, when 5 million more teenagers got a smartphone than had ever had one before. Well, here's some alarming stats. Self-harm rates are up 62% among 15 to 18-year-old girls compared to 2010. Self-harm rates are up 189% for preteen girls compared to 2010. Suicide is up 45% among 15 to 18-year-old guys compared to 2010. Suicide is up 70% among 15 to 18 year old girls compared to 2010. Suicide rates among preteen children are up 151% compared to 2010. Holy moly. So in 2010, 5 million more teenagers got a smartphone than had ever had one. And what that means is that teenagers began scrolling all day comparing their lives to others on social media. They began receiving immediate feedback to their posts, both good and awful. They were now able to play video games wherever they were, any time of day, and look at pornography any place they were. We can almost link the mental health of a generation of teenagers to literally one thing, and it's unprecedented, screens. And this has isolated a whole generation. Isolation isn't good. There was a series of experiments towards the front end of the 20th century. They got a rat, a lone rat, and they put him in a cage. 
And in the, rat, in the cage with the rat, they put two water bottles in, in the cage. One was with just water, and the other one was laced with drugs. Almost every single rat in this experiment preferred the drug water over the regular water, and almost every single rat died quickly. Now, in the 1970s, Bruce Alexander, a professor of psychology in Vancouver, noticed something about the experiment. They were putting this rat in a cage, in an empty cage, all by themselves, all isolated. They had nothing to do in there except use these drugs. So he thought, let's do something different. Let's change the experiment up. So he built a cage that he called the Rat Pack. It's heaven for rats. They've got loads of cheese. You can show, there they are. Loads of cheese, loads of colored toys, loads of tunnels. They've got loads of friends. They've got both the water, the good water, and the drug-laced water. But here's the fascinating thing about the Rat Pack. The Rat Pack, they don't like the drug water. They almost never use it. They never use it compulsively, and not one single rat in the experiment overdoses. When they were isolated, there was an almost 100% overdose rate. Now in community, they never overdose. Some even learned to play instruments, and they formed a band. <laughs> when they have connected lives, none of them get addicted. The five most frequently reported issues among teenagers today are depression, Pornography addiction, anxiety, social anxiety, loneliness, impulsiveness, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We all know this isn't good, but we and our young people are unwilling to unplug. And parents are exhausted from, from this fight. Dude, put your cell phone away. And the kid's like, well, I will when you put your cell phone away. Why will we not unplug? Why will we not help our kids unplug? Because happiness today is all the rage. Bobby McFerrin's song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, in 1988 was a huge hit. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy now. All right. It was a huge hit. And the lyrics summed up America's mindset at the time. One characterized by the avoidance of all things emotionally unpleasant. The pursuit of happiness is emphasized so much in our culture today that some parents think it's their job to make sure their kids are happy all of the time. So when little Tommy feels sad, his mom and dad feel like it's their responsibility to cheer him up. When little Tommy feels angry, it's their job to calm him down. Little Tommy has grown up believing that he doesn't that if he doesn't feel happy around the clock, then something must be wrong. And this has done more bad, more harm than good for little Tommy. And as he gets older, it results in inner turmoil. Little Tommy never learned that it's normal and even healthy sometimes to feel sadness and to be frustrated, to even feel angry or guilty or disappointed or bored. Okay. Are you tired of bad news? You're like, Brock, you've depressed us. Now I need to go take my antidepressant. Or pull my cell phone out and make myself feel better. 
Let's go to the scriptures where we will see a generation in a weary land find rest for their souls. So there's the great story in the book of Exodus, and it's of the people of Israel and their journey through the Sinai Desert. And this journey is one of the greatest survival stories of all time. More than two million people wandering through a land of sand and barren rock, homeless, looking for a land of abundance, a place to call home. When will life be good again? When will I not feel so lonely and anxious and tired? There's no real source of food in that desert. Water was as scarce as it is on the surface of the moon. Look at this passage in Jeremiah 2, verse 6. It says, describing the land, it's a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and death where no one lives or even travels. This is more than a moment in Jewish history. It's, it's recorded as one of the greatest analogies of our human experience. Our journey from bondage to freedom is not an easy journey. Our journey from the barren to the promised land. Ultimately, it's the precursor to our journey of salvation from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light the kingdom of God. And it's a story from the primal drive for life that's so compelling that it caused thousands upon thousands of Jewish people, these rescued slaves, to mount a rebellion. What is their rebellion? To go back to the bondage in Egypt just to have their familiar ways back. That's sobering. I'd rather be a slave Jeremiah chapter 2, look at this, verse 12 through 13. And the heavens are shocked at such a thing. And shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can't even hold no water at all. They prefer their brokenness and their comforts. This is playing out in a post-pandemic world. We only sort of want God now. We only sort of want God What we really want is to feel better. What we really want is for life to be okay again. If God seems to be helping, sweet, awesome, we'll believe. If he does it, well, we'll get back to him later after we chase whatever we think will fill our famished cravings. A few months ago, we're in, in, in the youth lounge. It's youth group. Youth group is one of my favorite places on the planet. Um, I'm one of those weirdos that not only loves teenagers, I actually like them. And uh, we're in the room, a little worship. I get up and I speak about Jesus and how he is wanting to do a couple things in your life. He's wanting personally to enter into your story by the power of his Holy Spirit. And he's wanting to do a work in you and he's wanting to bring you into a flourishing community. So it's God and us. God and us. Afterwards, a teenage boy walks up to me. And uh, he's like, hey, and I could tell he wants to talk to me. I'm like, hey, how you doing? He goes, yeah, I'm, I'm good. You ever have someone answer the question and you're like, mm, you're not good. <laughs> so you, uh, how, are you, how are you really doing? Immediately tears fill his eyes. 
We're standing there, kids all around. He looks at me and he goes, Brock, I just feel lonely all the time. It's all, it's never gone. I feel all by myself. I'm utterly alone. Here's the truth. Our God has provisions for us. And I know, I know, every one of you, I know what you're thinking because I'm thinking it too. What we really need right now is a three-month vacation on the beach. That's what we need. Walking on the beach, drinks on the deck. And with all my heart, I hope you get that and you bring me along. But for most of us, a three-month sabbatical on some gorgeous refuge is not available, at least not in the moment. Do you want to know what is available? The river of life. God himself, in ways maybe you haven't tapped into in a very long time. And it's like you're in a desert and you're dry, and you're so dry, you're not sure if you even care anymore. But God wants to make this life, this abundant life, available to you, and I feel like he wants to begin something in you this morning even. My uh, family, not long ago, went hiking. When you're a kid, the idea of hiking sounds awful. Remember being a kid, your parents are like, hey, let's go for a hike. And you're like, you mean a walk where we're doing nothing? <laughs> when you get older, though, there's just something amazing. It's like you become a child again, and you're like, oh, my gosh, look at the birds. That's an owl. That's an owl. Like you, it's, like you, it's, it's like this. You're reborn, and you're hiking. And so we go hiking. My daughter's a teenager. We have our dog, me, my wife. Our daughter, our dog. And I know that there's this really cool river, so I say, wear your bathing suit. We'll jump in the river along this hike. It's going to be sick. You already think the story's going to go bad, don't you? (laughs) Well, you're right. We get to the river, and it is a fast-moving, wide, white river. (laughs) And it's loud, and it's ominous, and you're just like, oh, the, the, the thing for me, because I was born with what's called brain damage. All men have it, and most teenagers brain damage. We don't think about the consequence. We don't think what could happen. We're overconfident. I'm standing on the edge of the bank of this river, and it's just white and rapids, and I'm thinking, dude, we got to jump in. (laughs) So I look at my daughter, who's so beautiful, sitting here on the front row. I look at her, and I say, to my wife and her, let's swim across. I think we could swim across. They're like, my wife's like, are you insane? Like that is, it's forever across, and as soon as you jump in, you're gonna be taking five miles down down river. Like this, this is insane, this is dumb. I'm like, no, 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 it's easy. There's no like big rocks in there, we're fine. She's like, you're, you're, you're nuts. Forget it. But my daughter at this point is probably about 15, and she's still kind of stupid. <laughs> like me. She still has that daredevil in her. I'm like, sweetheart, let's do it. We can do this. And she looks at me, and she's like, yes, we can. <laughs> so on three, we jump in. One, Two, three, we fly in. What I didn't realize was that our dog, who is amazing, just goes wherever I go. 
So we jump in and our dog boom, flies out with us. We hit this river and go flying down this river. And it's like up and down. And I'm paddling and I'm looking back at my wife and my dog. It's like, ah! it's absolutely insane. At this point, I realize this is too strong of a current. It's too insane. It's overwhelming. I need to make sure we don't die. So I grab my daughter, and together we are working hard to get to the edge. And we finally get to the other side, and it took an immense struggle. I was exhausted. And I look, and our dog is like 15 miles down the river. So I jump back in. And I head off after him, and I actually catch him, and I get him, and we hike up the other side of the river. We find my daughter. We hike over to the other side. We, we uh, hike over a bridge to where my wife is waiting for us. And she's like, I hate your face right now. <laughs> the life of God is described in the scriptures as a river. A powerful, gorgeous, unceasing, ever-renewing, ever-flowing river. Ezekiel says that it's a river of life, and it's an image of abundance, and it says this in Ezekiel 47, verse 9, where the river flows, everything will live. Everything will live. Everything thrives. This is what we want, to live, to find life and its fullness again. The apostle John had a similar revelation, and he writes about it in Revelations chapter 22. And he talks about it. This is the image of the kingdom of God coming, and he saw a river of, the flowing, of, this, of this life flowing right down in the middle of the city of God, right down the middle of the street. Revelations 22, one says it this way. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God. Literally, the river of life flows from the throne of God. And of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Why? What's the big deal? Oh, and these leaves? The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. There's so much life flowing from God that it flows like a mighty river like a mighty river, and it's helping and restoring and renewing and healing and bringing life. Isn't that awesome? Now, follow me now. The river of life is just not in Revelation 22, which is the future. Jesus states clearly that the river is meant to flow out of our inner being right here in this life. Jesus said this in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. He's, Jesus stood and he said in this loud voice, he wants everyone to make sure they get this. Let anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. They won't have to wait for the renewal of all things. I'll begin my renewal inside of you, here and now. This is all about the mighty life of of God flowing in you and through you and saturating you like a river. Now, let me pull this together. Yes, say no to your kids. Limit their access. Limit their screen time. Mark's been saying this for three weeks. Kids, stop 
fighting your parents on this. It's destroying your generation. The history books were right about this. Stop fighting this. Rebel. Rebel. It's killing you. It's killing me. It's killing all of us. And if you're honest, you feel it, don't you? I do. Even in this moment. Sometimes when the quiet is on, I bet you become more aware of it. Sometimes when you're away from the noise and the busyness, I bet, I bet you, be, it's, that's when you reach for your cell phone so you don't have to think about it, you don't have to feel it. You can feel the deep thirst for more inside of you. You're aware of your thirst. Jesus says, come, all who are weary or hurting or broken or addicted or thirsty or insecure or feeling all alone, and I will give you life and rest and quench your thirst. I was speaking before the pandemic at a huge youth conference. I spoke Friday night. Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning. 12,000 kids in this arena. 12,000 teenagers. Saturday night comes, and I've been talking about similar things that Jesus wants to work in your life. He wants to, that hollowness, that pit in your stomach, he wants to fill that void. He wants to do an amazing thing in and through you. He wants to invite you into this adventurous life, this expectant life. He wants to fill you with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, forbearance, self-control. He wants to do this in you. It's Saturday night. I walk onto the stage. The stage lights turn on. Arena full of kids. I look down. There's three teenage girls right here at my feet. Okay, that's, I look closer, they're all weeping. I haven't even told my best story. <laughs> weeping. I've been down. I'm like, this is weird. At these conferences, they have a countdown clock, and you're, it tells you how much time you're losing. And I knew, I was like, this is going to be a tight talk. I don't know if I can, but I'm just like, forget it. I'm like, what's going on? And I take my mic off. Girls, what's going on? They can barely speak. And this one girl speaks for the other two and says, Brock, we want what you're talking about. We want to know Jesus. We want the real thing. We're sick of this. And what I saw in their eyes was desperation. Desperate. Desperate enough to interrupt a whole conference. Do you feel your own desperation? Mark chapter 10 is one of the greatest stories, and I want to end with this. In Mark's gospel, we, we read about a man who caught Jesus' attention because of the man's own desperation. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 46, and it says this, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man named Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. 
So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped at it to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. I was walking the neighborhood last night just praying. It, it's, it's, a, it's actually a nightly ritual for me. I just walk the neighborhood and I pray for my neighbors and I pray for our church and and I just, I wasn't even going to, this morning I, I added this verse. I just felt last night, this, uh, I think Jesus is asking you this morning, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? Like, I imagine myself in the story as Bart- Bartimaeus. I'm not blind. But I imagine myself waiting in the dusty, crowded streets there of the Middle East, desperate, and I spot, I can see myself, I spot Jesus through the crowd, and I'm desperate for his attention, and I repeat over and over again, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And in my mind, I can see Jesus turn. I get his attention. And he's looking. He's looking for me. Where is this voice coming from? What? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And our eyes meet. The noise of the street fades into the background. I'm only aware of Jesus. All of a sudden, all I see now is Jesus. Time stops. He has my full attention. He calls me to join him, and as I approach, he asks, what do you want me to do for you? I share with Jesus what I'm most desperately needing, and I pray, please have mercy on me. Work in me. God wants to wake us up because this morning he wants to work in your life. I'm going to invite the band to come up. I felt like this morning, God really wants to touch some of you. He wants to free you. You know, anxiety is not just a plague of the young. It's a culture-wide plague. The restlessness that you see on young people tends to be a restlessness that you see on all people. And the river of life wants to flow in you. And wants to do a work through you. Wants to heal your heart and your mind. Some of you are holding on to anger and bitterness. You're angry all of the time. And you don't even know why. You can't even express. But you, something will set you off. And... You're just so angry. Some of you are plagued with addiction. You can't stop doing the things you hate doing. Many of us know the long nights of darkness and depression. Some of us have been praying the same prayer over and over again, and we are without any hope. But Jesus is walking down that dusty road in that crowded room, and he hears your cry. Jesus, have mercy on me. If 
what Brock says is true, I want it. Work in my life. Free me. Will you stand with me? If you're able. Aaron and the band. Girls, you can come right up here. I'm just going to hang here. We can fit. Um, I'm going to have them lead us in a bit of a song. But here's, all right, four, fourth and fifth graders. You with me? When we sing these prayers, that's all they are, they're prayers. The secret is to act like they're your words. To let them become your words. To sing them from your, from your gut. And we're gonna sing a bit of a song I'll come back up and I'll tell you what we're going to do because I just feel like those who are aware this morning of their need for Jesus, he's going to meet you. I just feel it. Let's, let's sing a prayer.